Well, hi there, and welcome to this week's episode of The Pantry Chat, Food for Thought. This week, I'm really excited to have a special guest on to talk about a topic that I don't really know a whole lot about, neither Josh or I do. And so we are introducing Kaylee here from um, The Honeystead, who knows all about beekeeping. And we're going to be talking about getting started with beekeeping. So welcome, and thanks for coming. Thank you guys for having me. I absolutely love talking about bees. So I'm excited. Let's dive in. This is the perfect time to start talking. All right. And, you know, I don't know. It seems like a little off season to be talking about this right now. But we, I don't know. We'll we'll see what you have to say about that. Maybe you don't agree with that idea. (laughs) But I know for Josh and I, planning happens this time of year. So if we're going to bring in a new top, a new, you know, project on the homestead, We're starting to think about it right now to make sure we're kind of lined out for the following year. So this is kind of high up on our list. We've been wanting to keep honeybees for years, but this new property property we're living on, we're going into, I think our fourth winter here, um, actually had the benefit of our, our big local beekeeper in this county lived in this house back in the 70s. And he said, there is just not enough bee food in that area because we are really isolated in this tight little river valley and we don't even have neighbors. So we literally do not see honeybees on our property coming in from anywhere else. We're just so isolated. So we've really been working at building the bee food. So all the fields now are planted with clovers, all sorts of, like we've got a lot of bee food going on now. And we're getting to the point where we think, okay, we're about ready to be able to support at least one hive of bees to get started and see how they do. So that's kind of my background on the beekeeping (laughs) side. Um, But let's hear a little bit about you. Where do you live? What do you, I know you've got like an active homestead where you're at, you do all sorts of fun things. So tell us a little bit about yourself. So um, long story short, uh, we are modern day homesteaders here in Virginia. Um, My family and I, uh, we work and we raise and grow uh, the majority of our food as well as herbal medicine um, on 60 acres that's kind of nestled right in the, the Skyline Drive of Virginia. So we have such an abundance of trees and just the wildlife that's all around us. Um, But we do the majority we do what we can uh, to try to be as sustainable as possible, not just for us, but also for our bees. Um, so, you know, long story short, we've been doing it for a good couple of years. And, you know, it's just every year there's something kind of new and we're growing and changing and morphing. And I think that's just the beautiful part of homesteading is that it's not always one thing. You know, there's so many different entities inside a homestead to to kind of have that uh, regenerative aspect and the growing aspect. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so thankful of that. I get bored really easily. And (laughs) so this is just uh, homesteading is the perfect answer for me because it's always something new. You know, there's always something, whether it's the seasons changing and it's keeping you on your toes or working with nature and you have to be so responsive, but there's always room for another project of some sort because there's so many opportunities when you get onto the homestead. It's, it makes it a lot of fun. (laughs) It's never, there are never any dull moments on the homestead. So not at all. No, we, you know, we had a really, this is not even homesteading, but we had a really interesting moment two nights ago um, where Josh and I said that to each other. And that was, we were sound asleep in bed about 2 a.m. in the morning, and it had just started raining. And all of a sudden, we heard squealing tires and brakes and like cracking and breaking. And we live in a part of the road is real close, but it's a very not often used road. It's pretty lightly traveled. And somebody had a little too much fun out a little too late and apparently, and they actually took out part of our pasture fence amazingly, like we thought we were calling 911 and there was going to be a real problem. But uh, um, amazingly, they backed out of it and were able to get out of our pasture, which was muddy at the time, and take off down the road. And so we were just left with uh, 
some fence oh, to repair no. before the sheep got out. But it was one of those moments where we turned to each other and we're like, you just, there's never a dull moment. There's never, never you know, and you immediately go, okay, the guy's alive. I'm really glad for that. Hopefully he makes it home safely without injuring anybody else. Um, and the sheep are going to get out if we don't get out there right now and go fix the fence because at first light, the sheep are going to see that hole and be out on the road. <laughs> and so you just, you know, you're always dealing with something. You just go with the flow. I mean, I completely understand. We've had many moments on our end as well. And it's just, you know, this is what's happening right now. So that's what you jump into and you just do it. Um, just, there's just definitely go. never, never a dull moment. Yeah, absolutely. So how did you get started with beekeeping? So a long time ago, um, my story kind of goes back basically for my childhood. Um, I was that weird kid that would always flip over rocks to see what type of bugs were underneath of them. Um, I didn't have necessarily like TV that we watched. Um, I wasn't really into video games. I was always outside, um, always foraging, always learning about different plants. And, um, my favorite, one of my favorite things that I would ever do was to, to go horseback riding. And mm. so the, the farm that we had our horses on was a 3000 acre farm nestled right here in Virginia. And I mean, it was just beautiful. And, um, we didn't own that property. We like leased our horses on it. And so the, the farm hand that managed the property, I think I was about seven, eight years old, um, he told me, he was like, you know, I don't want you going down this certain trail there. There's a beekeeper there and, and you probably best to just keep your distance. Well, what kid listens? Okay. <laughs> so, so I, I would hop on my horse and I would ride uh, down the trail and it, it, we always would go horseback riding kind of in that afternoon where there was, you know, that golden hour where it was just, the sun was just right. And I remember sitting up on the hill and seeing all the, the rows of hives and they were all painted white. And when the bees were returning home, the sun would just kind of glisten on their wings. And it looked like, I mean, it looked like fairies. It looked so magical. And I just immediately was like, you know, at some point in life, like I would love to be a beekeeper. And, you know, now life happened got married, moved away. My husband was in the military. Um, once he got out, we came home, we started our family and it just wasn't time, but I still wanted to learn. And I still wanted to, you know, try to take advantage of not having it right then and there, but always keep it in my, in my back pocket. But that's something that I was passionate about. And so when my husband and I decided to start our homestead, um, that was the first thing that I jumped right into. And so we've been, you know, doing it ever since. And my family came along with me. My husband's there for the honey, but he doesn't get into the hives. And every once in a while, he'll help me catch a swarm. Uh, but he's more like, oh, baby, go. And, and I do my thing. Uh, but I don't do it alone. I have my parents that are active in it as well. And my, my kids, as they have gotten older, they're not as active in it. Um, but who knows, maybe when they get a little bit older, they'll come back around. Uh, but basically, I fell in love with just how they made me feel. Um, and then now as an adult, seeing the vital, uh, important aspect that they offer for, for your homestead. And right now, if that's your passion and you're planning on getting bees, I would say, uh, and then you've already started sharing your, your homestead and documenting that, you'll see a huge difference when you start to bring in the pollinators. I wish I would have documented my homestead from the beginning. I wish I would have shared what my pastures looked like then to what they look like now. And then understanding the benefit of, you know, if you're raising cows or sheep uh, or even chickens, the bees are making the food for your pasture. They're, they're growing your pasture. So they're just helping. It's, it's an entire system and how it works together is just, it's completely beautiful. That's wonderful. That's, that's really neat. In some of your videos that I've watched, this is, this totally gets me because I, I would like to be the one out there working with the bees. I know Josh is tough and he'll go do it. And, you know, if I ask him to, he would get out there, but 
I see you working with your bare hands with the bees. Now, a lot of times I do realize those are swarming bees and swarming yes. bees are known to be very peaceable. They're not looking to start a war or protect anything <sighs> because they're outside of their colony. But even mentally knowing that, I do not know that I could walk up to a swarm of bees that I'm telling myself they're peaceable. They don't, <laughs> they're not looking to sting me and like put my hands into them and let them crawl o- over me. Do you like... Is that something innate in you that you feel like you're just comfortable with the bees or did you have to learn that like comfort level to be able to do that? I think it's both. Um, Mm -hmm. I do think it's both. You know, when you, so what's interesting, bees, they have a personality and, and depending on the weather and depending on the time of year and depending on what's happening, if you're able to kind of read them, um, you there's a comfort level that I have gained. Do I trust them? Um, depends, you know, it's, it's kind of just like a a livestock animal. Like you can't fully trust it because you just never know. I don't recommend uh, a brand new beekeeper go barehanded right away. Um, but there are some benefits and, and yeah, I mean, depending on the year, sometimes I'll even work the colonies without my gloves on, but I learned early on kind of sharing and documenting my beekeeping Uh, hive inspections, what I don't want is to share a false sense of reality towards new beekeepers. So I do wear my gloves the majority of the time. I also do manage roughly how many times I do get stung and where I get stung. Um, I do try to use it for like a therapy uh, for um, arthritis. There's a whole Mm -hmm. lot of information for uh, apotherapy and, and bee sting venom to help with arthritis. So I do try to manage that. Um, But yes, it's, you know, it's just one of the moments, you know, you just, you do what you do. And I'm able to kind of gauge a little bit of their attitude. Um, And there are some times where I'm like, yeah, okay, they're pretty gentle. And then I'm like, no, just kidding. After a couple of things. (laughs) And then I suit up and I respect them. And I'm like, okay, all right, I get you. I'm hearing you. So So do you think that because I go into beekeeping with uh, this like natural, ooh, I'm uncomfortable with the idea of getting stung, is that automatically going to make me like not a good beekeeper? No, (laughs) not at all. And you're going to hear other beekeepers, you're going to hear old school beekeepers just say you need to be getting stung all the time. Um, And you're going to hear beekeepers who are like, "I I rarely ever get stung. I think that really just depends on what your comfort level is. And then the one thing that I'll add is just like animals, the bees will be able to sense your emotion and and your hesitation, you know? So if you approach it nervous and antsy and and jittery in a way, they're going to be able to kind of feed off of that. Um, But when you get your first opportunity to get into the hive and you're taking it all in, you know, you're breathing the smell of the honey, of the, the wax, of, you know, it's just the comb. I mean, it's, I wish I could figure out a way to document the smell of a colony because it is like a thousand flowers. I mean, it's everything that they forage just combined into this box mixed with the sweet smell of honey and nectar and pollen. But it almost, it almost takes over your emotion. You know, it almost just completely for me, it calms me all the way down. So I I definitely use it therapeutically. Um, It's kind of my therapy. I mean, I go in there and if I'm heightened, if I'm stressed out and I go in there and I start working with the girls, um, they're going to easily tell me like, you need to cool your jets. (laughs) So I have to kind of be calm. Um, And, and I think that that's something that you'll learn. You'll get a, you'll be able to appreciate them for what they are when you have an opportunity to get in there. Mm, that sounds wonderful. It sounds like a, a great thing to be doing in a world that feels a little stressful, you know, and oh, a little yeah. crazy. It, it sounds like a very just calming. And uh, that I know for me, one of the challenges that I have in life is I am such an idea person and such a visionary that sometimes I have a real hard time existing right here and right now. And that sounds like something, whether it is from the kind of nervous fear factor or just, you know, the uh, maybe the intoxication of the experience like you're talking about, it sounds like it would be very uh, grounding 
Like it Absolutely. would make very present right there. Well, the it, I mean, and if you are not present, if you're not focused, if you're not paying attention, you could wreck their world, you know? Yes. So there is that aspect as well. I mean, they have their entire, they're more than just a box of bugs, you know, right. and, and how they communicate and what they're doing. They have such their, their own community. Um, so, you know, anything that you do could affect them. And so going in there, being grounded and being aware of your actions, um, I think it's, it's very helpful, but absolutely, you tend to block out all the noise that's going on around, you know, and you just are truly focused with what is in front of you. Um, and mm -hmm. it's beautiful if you allow yourself that time to kind of dive in and embrace it. Um, there's not that many people out there that are beekeepers and will understand that feeling. Um, but the people who are beekeepers and get into beekeeping, that's the first thing that most of them talk about is just their, their overall sense of engagement that they, that they have with their bees. And you do, you form a relationship with them. I mean, I, I talk to them. I know that sounds weird, but I love my girls and, you know, and I love the boys too, when they're around, they're kind of gone right now. Um, but you know, it's, it's definitely a beautiful relationship that you, you gain. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. That sounds really neat. So about 10 years ago, I was living on a piece of property where we thought we may be able to keep bees. And so I was doing some research and about this time, and I wish I could tell you guys details. I'm sorry. I know everybody's going to want to know the details of this. But about that time, two different homesteading type magazines came out with two different articles from different authors promoting their beekeeping books, but talking about their beekeeping experience. And they were so drastically different <clears throat> that um, it really stood out to me. One of them pretty much said, here's your basics for keeping bees. However, this is an extremely challenging time in history to keep bees. And I really can't say that I wholeheartedly recommend newbies to get started because of, you know, colony collapse and um, all the mites and all the different problems. And then there was this other article from this guy who I believe is a Russian permaculturist. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, you know, I went totally away from all the normal beekeeping uh, advice out there. And I just have this wonderful magical experience with the bees. And now I have so many hives because they keep multiplying that I like pretty much supporting myself off of all the honey. And, you know, you, you can imagine which of the two guys book I purchased because right. the one was like, this is the best thing I've ever done in my life. And the other was like, yeah, I really can't say it's good for people to get started doing. And, you know, that, kind of creates this real juxtaposition. I do know, for those of you guys who are interested, that second book was uh, Beekeeping with a Smile. Oh, Dr. Leo. Yeah. Okay, He's good. good. <laughs> yes. The translation, though, is a little rough and it's not yeah. necessarily like a perfect English. And I do know we've got a lot of really good books out uh, recently on natural beekeeping. Um, but uh, you know, that was just such a strong juxtaposition between those two points of view that it really stood out to me. Does it really come down to like the difference between natural beekeeping and kind of commercialized beekeeping being that hinge factor or, or that sounds so simplistic as much as I'd like to believe that? Beekeeping is very, you, you have to be extremely flexible with beekeeping. And after after a couple of years, what you'll learn is you know the basics. If you learn the basics and then allow yourself to be fluid with the bees, you know, like for instance, honey harvesting. If I were to have harvested an abundance of honey this last go around, um, last year, let's just talk last year, I don't think that they would have had enough food uh, for the winter because our fall was not as uh, prolific. We weren't as abundant as what we normally were. Um, now this year, I mean, everything, I feel like we are, I feel like we honestly had a very beautiful fall and they're bringing in the pollen, they're bringing in the nectars, we're kind of phasing out. Um, you know, so if I were to be, basically if I were to be textbook uh, with my beekeeping techniques, I don't think that that's 
fair for the bees. So I mm -hmm. think that you do have to kind of gauge it. And there are so many different ways to beekeep. There are so many different hive setups. There's so many different um, individuals with their experience. And you also have to take into consideration your location. Um, depending on where that person wrote their book, you might not be uh, exactly adequate for your location. You know, so take, learning the basics is key. Learning identification, what's happening inside the hive. It gets to the point where after so many times of, your doing, of you doing your hive inspections, you will start to read your colonies like a book. They tell a story. And as long as you're able to pick up on, on what's happening, then, you know, you put the book down, essentially. Um, but absolutely, you're going to hear it from multiple different beekeepers. You know, my technique might be completely different than somebody else's. Uh, my hive style is different, you know, uh, well, it's more traditional because we do run Langstroth colonies. Uh, is that something that I want to forever run? Probably not, you know, and I, I recognize that, but we have so many colonies right now that I don't want to switch everything up. Um, so I'm kind of, this is, you know, where I am at as a beekeeper is you just kind of have to go with the flow really in all honesty. Yeah. And that's something that's so true. And I think a place that we get into trouble a lot in modern agricultural and agriculture and conventional farming is that we want to take living elements mm -hmm. and treat them like they're little cogs or little pieces of a puzzle. And they really aren't. They're living elements. They're living right. things. And there's this unpredictability that comes with them. And there's a personality, but there's also all these nuanced pieces that, you know, honestly, probably even experienced master beekeepers don't even know all the different elements that are affecting the bees in any given year. So it's learning this kind of intuitive, you, you have to start somewhere, you have to get the basic yeah. information, like you're saying, but then allowing yourself to use your intuition mm -hmm. and to go with us. Years ago, I heard a piece of advice. It was actually on um, parenting and I thought it was brilliant. And I've found that it applies to so many things on the homestead. And that was read everything you can get your hands on, learn from everybody and then throw it all out and do what works. Yes. And that just, when come, when you when you come to something living, whether it's a sauerkraut ferment and you've got living bacteria or it's a child or it's a hive of bees you've got to give yourself the permission to respond to the real world circumstance and the relational element of it absolutely and i think that that's that's the the most important lesson uh, when it comes to beekeeping that i have learned is you know the the biggest question that i get often is what what, what book do you start with? And my, the best answer I can say is go to the library, open up every single book that you can about beekeeping and pick the one that resonates with you. You know, there are natural beekeepers out there. There are um, people who aren't considered natural. Uh, I feel like I'm kind of that right in between. You know, I will assist my bees if they need it, but I also know when to step back. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they are the ones that are teaching me. Uh, I just have to be patient enough to listen. And I don't necessarily, I, at some point, you know, I've made mistakes and I've had failures and successes, no matter what. I mean, that's everything, especially homesteading. Uh, but, you know, give yourself some grace and, and learn from them. That's the biggest, biggest advice that I could mm -hmm. share. Oh, that's great. Okay. So I want to dive into a little bit of the nitty gritty here and the like actual practical application, because I'm getting excited. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and that is when somebody's thinking about getting started with beekeeping, let's say they're me, they don't really know that much. I have a very basic, basic understanding. Um, but what, you know, what are the first steps to take? What were the first things to do? The, uh, definitely. Well, right now, this is actually the perfect time to get started. You know, mm -hmm. you're going into the winter months, you're not having to deal hopefully with too much more gardening and outside. So you're kind of going into that phase of life where you're just kind of like, we're going to chill, 
You know, this is when you learn or plan or, or start to read. So this is definitely the, the perfect time. Um, I always do express that it's very important to kind of see what's in your community. Uh, it's great to have a, a an advocate, have somebody, have a, an organization like your, your local extensions office. They, if you have a local extensions office, um, most of the times they will share their, their beekeeping clubs that are in your area. Uh, come for out here, January, uh, time frame. They offer classes um, that you can sign up for and take. I do advise beekeepers to take some form of classes, um, whether it's online or self-taught. And that is even a little bit, you know, just bear in mind because depending on who's teaching that class online, uh, it might be different than your location. So the basics are still going to be the same. It just really depends on your location. So Finding local, I think, is very vital. Um, getting involved, finding a group, a community, talking B, you know, having that individual that you can talk B with. Um, I have a few people that I mentor as well as I still have some mentors because what I've learned is if you collectively think about beekeeping, so I'm in my hives, you know, every two, three weeks roughly. But the more people that you talk to and their experience of being in their hives, the more experiences you gain, if mm. that kind of makes any sense. And because they're going to face scenarios that you might not have yet or, or potentially will. So definitely look at your local extensions office and, and see about classes and clubs there. Um, that's always a perfect way to get started. Great. That's wonderful. So can you give us like a basic overview of how beekeeping, I don't want to say works, like, but mm -hmm. what, what's the year like? How does the process work look like for somebody who's keeping bees? So for me, I'll speak from my experience. Um, you always kind of have to be a season ahead. So right now, um, we're going to be, we're starting to get ready for winter and um, starting to make sure that our, our colonies have the abundance of food. Um, that they need uh, to kind of see them through. And then also making sure that the queen's laying, what they brood looks like, you know, kind of everything, checking for Varroa mite. Um, but then over winter, they they don't hibernate, so to say, you know, they, they basically, uh, they cluster, um, which basically they ball up in a very tight knit ball and they vibrate to keep the warmth. Um, and then they'll move throughout the colony and eat, you know, the, the honey that they have stored up. Once winter is kind of done for us, we're going into spring. Uh, that's a, ideally about the time that an individual would want to start beekeeping is in spring. I would start with a nuke, which is a nucleus of bees, not necessarily a package of bees. And if you can find somebody that sells bees locally, that's the ideal way. Um, I backtracking just a little bit about this being the perfect time and, and getting your education in your reading in your clubs in that'll connect you with beekeepers that are in your area who might supply bees. They might breed bees that you could buy a nucleus of bees. Um, so getting on that waiting list for them, getting all your equipment ordered during the winter months, because as soon as spring is here, you have to have everything kind of set up and ready. Um, so a lot of people think, oh, it's summertime, let's go get bees. And yes, every once in a while, you'll find somebody who wants to sell an entire colony as is, um, but that's kind of more rare uh, because that colony is working and they're doing, <laughs> you know, bringing in honey, they're, they're bringing in nectar to make honey. So, you know, that's a little more rare. So basically winter time for you is where you start educating, getting your hive style picked out, communicating with beekeepers that are in your area, taking your classes. Come spring, you're going to get your bees. You'll get them established and you'll, you know, start rocking and rolling and they'll be bringing in nectar, making honey, making more bees and just growing. And then for us, summer happens. We have a period, it's called the dearth, where we have no nectar flow. 
Uh, this year was a little bit uh, less than that. We actually, we, I, I feel like we didn't really experience too much of a dearth out here, um, not like the previous years uh, where we didn't have any nectar flow uh, for summer. But then what will happen is after summer, they'll start to kind of decrease in numbers. Um, you know, they're, they're uh, a season ahead. So they're starting to prepare for fall because come winter, they don't need the abundance of bees that you might have in spring and summer. So pretty much they know what they're doing and you just kind of ride it out with them. Um, and, you know, you get in, do your hive inspections every couple of weeks, check them, make sure that they're good. Your first year, you're probably, you're not going to be harvesting honey, um, depending on what your winter looks like. You're just going to kind of let them roll and, and wait and watch. Um, and then come spring, go through winter, <laughs> you know, come spring, you're pretty much going to be starting back at it. Okay, great. That gives us a great overview. So you did mention that you're inspecting the hives, I think you said every two to three weeks. Is Roughly. that kind of the ongoing work once you get, you know, past spring, you're kind of humming along um, and uh, two to three weeks? Is that what you're looking at for regular so, work? Is there more no, daily work? No, not really daily work other than just visually putting my eyes on the colonies and seeing what's going on, making sure that nothing is in there bear wise or any, any predators. Uh, but, you know, daily work, no, not so much. Uh, weekly work, yes. I'll go in and when the flow is on, when the nectar flow is really flowing, I, I don't bother them too much. Um, I let them kind of do their thing. Spring and fall are a little more critical for hive inspections on my, in my opinion, than summer because I want to make sure that the queen is laying uh, appropriately in the spring. Uh, and also because spring, they tend to swarm. So mm -hmm. if you have to do any of your colony splits and you've got to make one colony into two, spring would definitely be kind of the time that you would want to do that because what they'll do, what they're doing is uh, swarming is a fancy term for a bunch of bees moving, a bunch of bugs, insects moving in one direction at once. But in beekeeping terminology, swarming is just their natural way of reproducing. Um, and so essentially they outgrow their space and they need to, to separate and they need to divide. So the new queen that, that is created uh, will stay back at the colony and the old queen tends to fly off with multiple queens, with multiple new queens, um, and they'll go and find a new home. So spring and fall are definitely the times that I try to keep a very close eye on them uh, more so than ever. Mm, very good. Okay. Um, so it sounds to me like a really wise place to start would be maybe with one hive and then to naturally do that and let them multiply themselves as you get more experience, the hive starts to multiply and then you can grow. Or would you say, you know, we have a large family with two, would you start with three or that's just diving in too deep? <laughs> so I, I actually really advise everyone to not start with one colony. Okay. I actually go, go ahead and start with two. Here's the thing. You have double the opportunity to be able to gauge, especially as a new beekeeper. If you get two colonies and you see, okay, this one's actually doing really good, but this one right here not so much. Mm. You won't necessarily know that if that one colony, if you had one colony that was, that was weaker, you wouldn't necessarily have that experience to gauge, uh, to be able to understand, to see like, oh, what's going on. Uh, but the other aspect of it is, is come fall. If your one colony is doing really well and the other one, not so much, you could combine the colonies and, and we do that actually quite often. We will combine actually here in the next week or two, that's what I'm gonna be doing is combining the majority of my colonies that were late rescues that just don't have the food resources that, that I want them to have. Um, and so, you know, stepping in on that aspect uh, has been helpful for their survivability, um, but also for you knowing that it'll teach you, it'll, it'll give you a better opportunity to see both colonies and compare 
and learn and see like what a brood pattern looks like for a healthy colony versus a not healthy colony. Um, or you might to have two beautiful, abundant <laughs> colonies and then you're just golden. So. Yeah, no, that's great advice. And that that's really helpful to think about because I know for us, we have a large family, we're feeding a lot of people. So Josh and I have the tendency is like, oh, well, if we're going to do it, we better go big. Yeah. <laughs> that, that sometimes is not the best way to go. So that is helpful, though, to maybe not start all the way back with just one, but to have two, possibly even three, if the bee food allows and um and start there and just you know have that broader learning experience what is there a rule of thumb you've already touched on the variability of there's yeah. so many different things here there's so many variables but is there any sort of a rule of thumb of how much honey you would expect from one hive so it depends as well um if you are if you are running so okay they're gonna say anywhere from 25 to 100 pounds of honey from from one colony and but you have to take into consideration what type of colony you're having uh if you have a horizontal colony where it's you know it just like a a langstroth horizontal um you'll pull frames from that but you're not going to have that type of abundance so we have traditional Langstroth colonies where you you see the the box and then you stack the box and stack the box and basically what we're stacking are supers and and that is that's where they store the honey now with that in mind there are multiple different sizes so there's a medium box which is smaller or deep traditionally the most colonies um, will have a few deeps stacked and then a few medium stacked. Essentially the frames really just determine the size of the frame really determines how much honey you're, you're going to get from one colony. There's also different techniques. If you use a, uh, it's called a queen excluder, um, which basically is like this mesh uh, that eliminates the, it, it prevents the queen from going up into where the honey storage would be and lay. So if you have a queen excluder, you're going to have more honey. Uh, we don't actually use queen excluders. I don't want to limit where my queen goes. So with that, I will pull frames that are fully capped with just honey. But if there's brood on it, I leave it. I don't even touch it. I let them have it because I don't want to have to pull too much and then have to feed because I think that, you know, sugar water, if you have to do it, you have to do it. But that's not something that I want to necessarily do. Um, so I think that they make, you know, perfect food for them. And I don't want to interfere with that. But essentially, depending on the frame, okay, so if you have a medium box with eight to 10 frames, so you can get different sizes. So if it is uh, eight frames, one medium frame could weigh up to four pounds of honey. Could, that's basically what you would get from one frame. So by doing the math, that'll kind of determine whether you're getting 32 pounds or um, up to 40 pounds if you have eight to 10 frames. If you are running all deeps, that's a little bit different. The frame is deeper. So that could uh, range anywhere from six to seven pounds per frame. So if you have uh, eight frames, that's higher end of 58 pounds to um, up to 70 pounds if it's, if it's a 10 frame box, if that makes any sense. So it's very, uh, you gotta take into consideration what type of, what type of high body <laughs> that you have and that you're working with. Um, but you will end up with honey. I will tell you that <laughs> you'll end up with abundance of honey. Well, and I know from purchasing honey by the gallon, because we usually buy between five and seven gallons of honey every year for our household, um, that a gallon of honey is approximately 12 pounds, I think. Is that, yeah. is that correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're saying that, you know, we're talking somewhere between two gallons of honey, if I do that math up to like 
eight gallons of honey is eight kind gallons. of that range that maybe you could get. Yeah. Um, and, somewhere. Right. Absolutely. And it depends too on spacing. Um, if you space your, your frames out a little bit deeper, the, the bees will build out just a little. Um, if you space your frames a little bit wider, they could grow it uh, wider, if that makes any sense looking at how the honey is. Uh, but yeah, it really depends on the hive style that you're getting. But you could easily get that. Um, we average, we pull about, I think this year we pulled about 400 pounds of honey okay. um, from our colonies. And we didn't harvest from all of our colonies. Uh, we run around, we, we've kind of fluctuate between, you know, anywhere from 50 to 30 colonies uh, a year. So I think right now when we harvested, we were at like 36 colonies. Okay. That, but I didn't harvest from all of them because some of them were swarms that it would, it was their first year and they just, they need time. Um, but we also don't pull all the boxes. We only pull, we go through frame by frame and we only pull, uh, what needs to be pulled and then leave them with, with a lot. Well, and that makes sense. If you were a commercial, you know, big commercial company and you need to get every dollar you essentially can out of your hive, I'm sure sugar water is cheaper than honey. Yeah. And so they're taking as much honey as they can and saying, man, eh, we'll feed them the sugar water and we'll take the honey. Um, but when we can make those decisions for ourselves, we can say, you know, that's not healthy for the bee. That's not how God created the bees to, to be and what he created them to eat. So let's leave them their food and just take less. And, you know, potentially that means you may need more hives. Maybe it means you just produce less honey, but probably in the long run, it equates healthier bees and less work. Uh, it is. I believe, I mean, I do believe, I, I believe that the bees, you know, their gut health is a lot more, it's, it's a lot more critical um, than I, than I think. And, and yes, I have had to supplement some of mm -hmm. our colonies later in the year and they just, you know, it breaks my heart. You know, if I get called for a swarm catch in September, that does not give them enough time to build out and, and to be ready for winter. So, you know, I do my part. I also look at the bees just like I would my livestock in my field. If I had an animal go down, I'm going to stop what I'm going to do to try. Uh, yeah. But at some point also survival of the fittest does kind of play in to key. And I don't necessarily want bees that are, are not exactly healthy. Um, and, and I guess that's kind of where I stand on beekeeping in my approach. I do the best that I can, but I also let them do the best that they, that they can. And, and I'm okay making that decision. Yeah. And I think that's a really wise decision everywhere on the homestead. And we, we stand by that. You know, if we've got an animal that has birthing problems, livestock wise, we do everything we can to save that life, but you can guarantee they're not going to be in the breeding stock next year because no. you, know, you don't need to breed problems into the system. You need yeah. to keep breeding that opportunity, but you have to make the hard decisions to do that sometimes. But, you know, on the same front, occasionally we get the powdered milk replacer for the animals because we do have that emergency and we're going to keep it alive. We're not going to let it starve to death just because a mom didn't make it through a birth, a hard birth or something. So we're going to keep it alive and do what we have to do. But we're going to take all that into consideration when choosing the breeding stock for the next year. So yeah. I think those are good. So before we wrap up here, because we're getting down on time, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see brand new beekeepers making that you just like, if you could stop people from making one or two mistakes that you see, um, what would that be? Um, I would say treating for Varroa right away, uh, without okay. checking, without checking. I think, you know, I, I think that that's, I've, I've listened to a lot of beekeepers that are a little older and they immediately jump right into treat, 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 you know, mm -hmm. treat your colonies, treat your colonies, but what are you treating for? You know? And so I know Varroa might is the big conversation with, with bees and, and just what's happening to them. Uh, and there it's, 
yes, it is destructive. I've had varroa mite issues with our colonies. Uh, I'm actually kind of facing one right now. It was a swarm that I caught and it was just loaded. Now looking back at it, I don't necessarily think that that was a swarm from a reproduction of them reproducing and splitting and dividing. I think it was an absconding situation, Mm -hmm. which is the bees kind of something was bothering them uh, back at their colony, whether it was a high row account, which I'm putting money on it now looking back. Um, But, you know, everyone, when I did my varroa check, I had a very unhealthy count of varroa and, and I, jumped in and I did go ahead and plan on, I did treat, uh, with, uh, an organic treatment that I felt like was safe for them. Uh, they're doing great right now, but everyone was very adamant that I go ahead and I just treat all my other colonies. Um, um, I I'm glad that I took the time to look at the other colonies and do a, an alcohol wash on them because their counts were within the threshold that they could survive with the Varroa that they had. So basically, uh, I'm glad I didn't go ahead and just treat all my colonies. And I'm glad that I let each, I looked at each colony uh, because I didn't want to treat if it wasn't needed. So they, Mm -hmm. that the Varroa won't potentially build up a resistance. Yeah. Yeah. That is so wise. Just on, I think on every medication, we can get way too fast to pre-treat things. And then that's exactly what you end up is you, end up with super bugs or super weeds or super something that just says, Hey, we got this figured out. We can work around it now. So I I think that's super smart, but great. Well, I know that you have um, a wonderful YouTube channel and I've been enjoying watching it. I was actually watching you and your mom make fire cider the other day every year. And I always love seeing all the different little personality spins that go into fire cider and um, and yours was really fun to watch too. Um, and you, people can follow by checking you out at your YouTube channel, which is the Honeystead. And you've got a lot of fun videos, a lot of great videos on beekeeping, but also using that honey and herbal medicine and all sorts of other things that you do over on that channel. So um, it, it's really fun to see other parts of the country and other, uh, you know, methodologies for doing different things. So Absolutely. guys, go check out Kaylee's YouTube channel. And thank you again as I'm really excited about jumping into beekeeping. We'll see if it makes it on to the actual project list for this year, or if we decide we've got to get the final orchard in first to have enough bee, bee food. But, um, but you've made me really excited about it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And I look forward to hearing what happens with you and your bees and your homestead and, and watch it grow. Yeah, well, we'll keep you updated. So thank you, Kaylee. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody.